I think generally we we approach anatomy a little bit differently in terms of how we use it for our artistic purposes. And maybe it has something to do with the way uh, we were brought into anatomy. Uh, like I said, for me, it was um, it was nowhere to be found. Uh, you know, it sounds like for you, it was everywhere to be found, right? It was kind of embedded in the religiosity of what you were studying. And then it immediately perfectly transitioned into a school that um, emphasized, if not fetishizes that as a subject. Uh, and, and for me, it was, it was nowhere to be found. There was no anatomy. Uh, you know, I had Stephen Roger Peck's Atlas of Anatomy. I, I, I got it when I was 14 years old because I knew that that book had some answers for me but I couldn't read it. I opened it up and I tried to read it and I, I couldn't read it. And, you know, because it's like uh, it, half of it's kind of Latin, right? And I'm like 14 and I don't, not, I don't have any help. <laughs> and so I looked at the pictures, right? But, but I think I was looking at the wrong pictures for a long time. I was looking at the very rendered pictures in, in uh, Peck's anatomy book. I wasn't looking at where he was making metaphors or simplifying forms. I was skipping those pages. Uh, and so it wasn't until later I figured out how to use that book. And it wasn't, you know, until later when I took some classes, uh, you know, not, not just anatomy classes like yours, but also just drawing classes, just, just better and more focused drawing classes, uh, that I started to understand what the, what the value of like Stephen Roger Peck's book was in relationship to like Elliot Goldfinger's book or any of the other anatomy books and, and how they relate to each other. Um, but anyway, back to the point, I, I think, you know, for me, my, uh, my artistic career was definitely focused conceptually and my instructors, uh, w became satisfied with anatomical execution, let's say a little bit prematurely, right? So if you could, uh, you know, even a little bit figure out a figure, they right away were like, you've got it. You're, you're an anatomical master, <laughs> you know? And it was quite, it was very confusing. Like, I, I think that that was a mistake some of my teachers made. Um, and, uh, and it kept me from really finding what I was looking for because they, they told me that I had already found it. And, and I, I thought, I guess I thought I found it. And I mm -hmm. thought, well, I'm already doing this right. Or I'm already doing this in the best, most useful, most whatever way. And it, I don't think that that was the case. So anyway, what I'm saying is that, um, you know, I think for me, uh, anatomy, you know, I was making art like a, like, like a mile a minute uh, the whole time, whether I knew anatomy or didn't know anatomy or knew how to use it or, or didn't. And so I've, I've always been making art despite the mechanism that maybe helps me make art now. And, and so I've always used anatomy as that, you know, I, I don't know if that makes it, a, what was the distinction you said Kenneth Clark made between a subject and a, what's the other one? Form. The a form, form of right. So, is. so I don't know that it, that's interesting that you said that I, I've actually strangely never read that book. It's a real gap in my like, <laughs> knowledge base. I should, should read that book. Um, yeah. But, uh, it, but, but anyway, I don't know how I fit into that categorization or even if I do, um, mm -hmm. Because I, I, you know, I, the way that I think about anatomy, the way that I use anatomy is as a problem solving mechanism. So, so the way that I think about it is, is that you have a composition and parts of those compositions are powered or are, are, are made vibrant by different mechanisms. And sometimes those mechanisms can be best resolved by understanding anatomy and deploying some of the, like, let's say anatomical motifs that mm -hmm. you might be facile with, <laughs> you know, that's, that's how I think about it. Right. Like I have a couple it, to put it as crudely as possible. I have a couple tricks up my sleeve and mm -hmm. when I need those anatomical tricks, I can deploy them for, you know, for better or for worse. It, maybe that makes that moment trite or maybe that makes that moment, you know, uh, mm -hmm. interesting in some way, but I kind of think of it like my, my images or my sculptures are compositional. And when I want anatomy to solve a problem, that's when I use it. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it seems to me, it occur- I, mean, I mean, I'm making an assumption here, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me like your relationship to anatomy is far more philosophically ingrained to the concept of the work itself. Uh, and, and so I'm I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that or about the work that you're making now, uh, Mm -hmm. and, and how it is that, you know, are you moving, do you feel like Mm -hmm. you're moving away from anatomy or is anatomy always part and parcel of what Mm -hmm. it is that you do? Um, Mm -hmm. how does it fit into, you know, you as an artist in the Mm -hmm. present? I was always interested in, um, anatomy's role in art when it was all being worked out. Mm. So uh, I guess earlier on, um, you know, uh, leading up to the high Renaissance mm. uh, with, uh, with Michelangelo and, and Leonardo um, and uh, maybe soon after, um, with, uh, you know, this, this towering, what to do about this towering example of Michelangelo's accomplishment mm-hmm. and how do we, how do artists, uh, carry the project forward without imitating mm-hmm. that. Um, but you already see at that point, the artistic challenge of, um, what to do with, a a, 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 a form of poetry that, um, is already beginning to kind of ossify. Um, and and set uh, because the exciting and uh, exciting era in artistic anatomy is is when it was all when it was all new and right. uh, uh, and by new I mean you know when they were kind of rediscovering uh, c- classical sculpture I mean literally unearthing uh, uh, unearthing classical sculpture and uh, the astonishment they felt at the the, the sort of the ex- the uh, expressiveness and the evident role of um, of uh, anatomical uh, knowledge, and uh, you know how did this happen? This 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 uh, you know uh, light uh, lightning bolt, mm. um, and so artists uh, then set about trying to uh, you know without knowing the answer ahead of time, but having a kind of exemplar, figuring out how. Um, how uh, an uh, anatomy, you know, sort of worked uh, on its own sake, but how also to uh, incorporate it into into uh, figurative art, how to create a sense of figural presence um, with gesture, um, volume, scale, and pathos. Um, uh, now, at that point, um, you know, once they kind of f- figured it out and sort of the ground had been covered, you know, like any sort of new poetic language, it just started to, uh, uh, started to, I guess the well was dry and mm-hmm. artists would use those, um, use those images, those metaphors uh, as, as sort of ways to get through certain problems, as you, as you mentioned. And they have been sustaining in that way, sort of, um, you know, they've been fulfilling that purpose really ever since. Mm. Um, But that, I'm not sure it's ever been quite the same as it was um, at that uh, period when you had Durer and uh, Mm. and Michelangelo and other, uh, you know, graphic artists and genius grappling with the uh, grappling with the issue almost for the first time. Mm. I mean, almost as though for the first time. And so they created a, a, a poetic language, a visually poetic language. And at that point, that language, uh, like, you know, I think there's also uh, a section in the, the Kenneth Clark book, you know, where he talks about that language having uh, set like concrete. Mm. And it no longer serves a poetic purpose. It serves other purposes. Right. So I always just tried to kind of mm, try to, in my classes and in my work, uh, try to um, steer more towards the, that, uh, that time when anatomy was, um, was poetic because it was new, mm. because it wasn't, uh, it wasn't codified. It wasn't, wasn't worked out. Right. You know, also took it that during this period, um, you know, artists weren't simply uh, drawing the way the figure looked or mm-hmm. were not simply drawing anatomical facts, but were um, drawing kind of all the ways the figures could be 
seen as examples of the kinds of shapes and graphic symbols that they already knew how to make and mm. already enjoyed making. That's the basis of the poetry of, of anatomy is a, um, is a, a, a graphic language, mm. essentially. And so the magic happened when that graphic language, which um, you know, c- consisted of uh, fairly, fairly straightforward kind of graphic symbols, you know, mm. S-curves, arcs, mm-hmm. um, when that uh, graphic language became um, sort of an interpretive system for, for anatomy. Mm. And so you had uh, suddenly, you know, uh, marriage of those two things. You had, you had new, you had new, new forms that seemed to open up a whole new domain of uh, sort of thought and feeling. That's where it's at for, for me. Um, I'm uh, currently interested in, um, in those, you know, the characteristics of the drawing that, that make it look drawn. Mm. Uh, And, that um, uh, that put on display the um, activity of the of the artist, mm, mm-hmm. um, and um, so uh, right now I'm sort of uh, making a lot of uh, drawings in in ink, um, in uh, that are um, uh, made with uh, the kinds of uh, the system of lines and uh, uh, lines that are characteristic of uh, engraving. So mm-hmm. I have. Uh, uh, swelling lines, lines that, you know, taper and swell and then taper again. Mm. And that also are non um, value based, uh, but instead are based on topographies uh, rather than on tonalities. Okay. Um, so there's a certain kind of um, engraving uh, where sort of the lines take on the value of color. Right. Uh, but then there's a certain kind of engraving, uh, which I think is um, particularly brilliant. Um, you know, it was practiced by uh, Holtzius, for instance, um, uh, and De Kain, uh sort of the Dutch, um, Dutch engravers, uh, where um, the um, characteristics, the, the surface uh, where the... Um, uh, characteristics of paths through space, um, r- rising and falling, uh, changing their orientation. Um, uh, that's more the, the basis of the visual language. Mm. Um, and so I see that as a visual, you know, starting with a visual language, um, a, a sort of a descriptive system or an interpretive system. Mm. And then um, using that as a fil- sort of a, a filtering device mm. for um, other things. Yeah. So what are those other things? Uh, well, those other things, uh, I'm not sure what those other, other things are. Those other things, uh, you know, might be what other folks would call subject matter, which I reluctant to call subject matter um, mm. because the minute you mentioned subject matter, um, uh, people's heads turn and see the subject matter as mm. the key to the, right. to the artwork. When in fact, um, the, horse and car relationship is completely different. So the subject matter is created by the form. Right. Um, and so the subject matter is in the cart and the, the form sense, the, the visual language that's on the, on the horse. Right. Uh, most of the time people see it as uh, completely, uh, completely, you know, re- the reverse. 